Morning, everybody. I guess we can get started. Okay. So let me just introduce um, the people here. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce Satyar Altre, who is unfortunately not here. He couldn't make it. Uh, but he's heavily contributed to the idea as well as the implementation. And we have Rahul here, um, my colleague, and I'm Anant. And, um, and again, our Minakshi, who's uh, our manager, also couldn't make it. So uh, we actually started with an idea for running NFV uh, on containers and uh, found a need for having standalone Keystone support for Docker. So hence, this idea came into place, so we thought we could also have a submission on this. So uh, let, let me get started on uh, what we have been working on overall. Um, we extensively worked on the compute side and LAN side. And with Cisco, uh, we've been working with a cloud VPN product uh, for the last couple of years. So let's get started on um, what we want to achieve here. OK. So if you uh, think of uh, Docker, what are, what, how do you authorize and authenticate at this point? Currently, you have user ID, password-based authentication, and uh, which essentially allows, once you get access to the Docker daemon, you would be able to run any command, and you will all be able to see all the containers that have been provisioned. And uh, there is no limit on the number of containers that one can provision. So these are some of the. Uh, areas which we felt uh, probably needed some more uh, improvement. We tried searching extensively and couldn't really find anything like this, though there are um, other OpenStack integration itself. We didn't find a standalone Keystone integration with Docker. So hence, this uh, idea came into place. And so what are the advantages of adding multi-tenancy to Docker? So let's say if we add a standalone keystone to provide multi-tenancy to Docker, uh, first of all, we'd be able to create partitions, and then each tenant or project would be able to manage his own containers. The idea is not to let others see the containers that you have spawned, and also provide role-based access control. And uh, as an administrator, we would be able to set quota limits. So based on your resource planning, or as a, in a, in a pay-as-you-go model, you would be able to control the amount of resources that are utilized by a particular tenant. And uh, also, uh, since Keystone supports multiple backend, uh, be it LDAP or Active Directory, so we can bring in those features here as well. And uh, even, uh, even an existing uh, setup where you already have the users in an Active Directory, you want to just extend that into a, a Docker setup, you could do that with the help of Keystone. And of course, Keystone has, uh, provides single sign-on capability, as well as with V3, we have hierarchical multi-tenancy support, so we can bring in those as well with nested projects. Now, and uh, last but not least, not only the users can get access to containers um, at a tenant level, what we are also planning to achieve here is have an identity service where the applications that are spawned on the containers can actually utilize the identity service, get tokens, and authorize with other instances of the applications, or in, in a multi-tier application, if uh, you're running them on multiple containers, you could actually authorize between each other. Like how even in OpenStack, you have the components of OpenStack uh, actually getting the token from Keystone to even interact with each other. Similar kind of application, who you, if you want to build that runs on containers, you could use this feature. OK, so since uh, we're actually dealing with s some of the technologies that are here, for the interest of people who are kind of beginning on this, I would like to go over some of the topics that we are touching upon. So I'll give a brief introduction to how authentication happens in Keystone. So Keystone has some of uh, these services. Uh, one is identity, which is essentially validating your user ID and password, credential validation. And then uh, we have a resources service, which deals with your projects and domains and uh, region and all that. And uh, assignment is uh, responsible for creation of roles, admin and member roles, and assignment of each role to a particular project or uh, you know, capability. And of course, token uh, is the token management, the life cycle of a token, uh, the expiry, and uh, whether it is uh, encrypted or what is the format of the token. We'll see a little more about that. 
And uh, service catalog is something which has, which is like a registry of all the services that are under consideration and what is the endpoint URL for each of the service. So when I talked about uh, running services on multiple containers, so how do we adapt that to this? We create entries for those custom services in the service table so that when you want to authenticate as soon as the entry is found here, so that is how you relate to a particular tenant or a token. And again, policy-based, uh, uh, so in, in OpenStack, we've seen this policy.json where we can edit the role-based access control. So a similar thing can be applied here as well. Okay, so when we talk about tokens, these, these are uh, the main types of tokens that are currently available for authentication. And there's, there's a bit of history here. So let me just brief for people who are not aware of this. So initially, the support started with UUID tokens, which are basically, um, 32 character long uh, unique identifier string and uh, which are persisted in the database, which is just an ID. So Keystone is responsible for actually linking that ID with a corresponding scope of that tenant, which is what is the service that the tenant can access, what are all the VMs or containers that the tenant can provision, and uh, what, what are the projects that are related to, and what is the role, whether it's member or admin. All that metadata is actually stored in the database, so all that you get is only the ID. So all this metadata is fetched from the database based on this ID. The drawback with that, of course, is when multiple services are communicating and authenticating using this token, every time you would go back to Keystone, which would fetch it from the disk, do a read, and then compare and see whether uh, this token is valid. Uh, so complete metadata is every time uh, fetched from the database, which means Keystone is going to be heavily loaded, and that creates a bottleneck when you talk about uh, scalable environment. So they, uh, they came up with a, a model called PKI, which is uh, public key infrastructure, which is a certificate-based authentication, So, which also was a persistent token, but the token itself carried a lot of information which need not be fetched from the database again and again. So the token itself would have a lot of information like your projects that you are associated with, what is the endpoint, and we talked about some of the services, the service table entry, what is the role, all that information is uh, available. So let me just quickly show you that. Yeah, so this is a sample payload of the uh, PKI token, and uh, you can see some of the uh, this is basically implemented in a JSON format and easy to parse. Uh, so this is packed with a lot of information, if you see, the service catalog that I talked about, and what is the created time, what is the expiry time. So this helps you process them and validate the token at a service level locally without having to go to Keystone for uh, each and everything. But as you see, this is packed with a lot of information. So that means the size of this token is going to be really huge. and uh, in, in cases, it, it was even seen to exceed the HTTP header limit. So actually, we, we uh, heard that even problems were faced in uh, Swift and uh, Horizon uh, when uh, such large tokens were used. So actually, PKIZ came up, which is just a compressed version of the same thing. Um, that also was still considerably high. So the latest one that has come up is Fernet tokens. There is also a debate on whether to pronounce it as Ferney or Fernet, but I guess Fernet is OK. Yeah, so these are non-persistent tokens, and they are based on symmetric key encryption, and they are considerably faster, and supposed to be 85% faster than UUID and 89% faster than PKI. This was introduced in Juno and relatively new. So since there are a lot of adaptations of PKI still existing, I guess this is something which would take shape in future. So for our uh, implementation or whatever we tried with providing Keystone support for Docker, we went with PKI. Right, now and right. We'll, be, we're planning to work on that and provide support for that in future. Yeah, yeah so this uh, is, uh, can you guys see this clearly? Okay, so I just want to go over a flow, how authentication happens, and once you are able to understand this, you would be able to figure out where exactly does this fit in, in case of providing authentication for Docker. Okay, so the user submits the user ID and password to Keystone, gets the token, because Keystone validates it against the database and provides a token, a PKI token, which has all the metadata that we talked about, and um, which is actually called as a CMS token. That's a cryptographic message syntax. That's a format in which uh, it is packaged, 
and uh, that is sent back to the user who incorporates that token in all the further requests that are sent to services for authentication. And uh, so this token is stripped from the request and uh, again processed. So some of the things that are extracted out of this token are what is the certificate authority, whether the certificate has been signed, and whether it's been revoked, what is the expiry, is it valid? So this check is done, and once the token is found to be valid, so the request is, of course, processed, and corresponding response is sent back. Similarly, if the uh, request is uh, rejected, uh, if the token is found to be not valid. Now, this is how a standard PKI-based authentication happens. So we'll look at how we are adapting this to suit Docker. So we went through this already. I'll give a short introduction to Docker. Um, it enables you to package an application in, 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 uh, on itself uh, with all its dependencies packed into a single unit. And um, it separates your applications and from infrastructure and how was VM was able to separate out the operating system part from the hardware, similar thing. And uh, it runs, the advantage of Docker is that it runs the same wherever you deploy it. And it's easy to build, ship, and run. Some of the main components, um, key components to look at in Docker is the Docker daemon, which is basically a background service which is responsible for managing all the containers that are spun up. So you connect to the Docker daemon if you want to write an API or you want to use the CLI. So like I said, API actually connects to the Docker daemon and uh, there are multiple endpoints available. And uh, CLI is, uh, again, it's, it's command line uh, com Docker commands that are used to manage your own Docker environment. Docker engine is actually a name. Uh, it's more a combination of all the other three that we discussed. And Docker machine is used to bring up a Docker swarm. Uh, Docker swarm is uh, like a cluster of uh, containers, like how uh, we have a vCenter or we have an OpenStack. Uh, you, you remove the host part out of it and just consider the available resources. So Docker swarm helps you to provision containers irrespective of which host it is in. So it manages a host of clusters, and uh, it helps you provision on that. So these are some of the key components in uh, Docker Swarm. There's a cluster manager, and then there's a Swarm node, which essentially is a particular physical or virtual node. And there is a scheduler, which um, has got basic filters and its own scheduler logic, which um, provisions containers on the Swarm nodes. And there's a Swarm store, which is uh, a JSON-based implementation, which uh, stores the state of the containers and all the associated parameters. So this is essentially what we would be using, the Docker Swarm store, for associating a tenant ID to the particular container. Now, we saw how PKI uh, authentication happens. And so one, in Keystone database, we would save the tenant information, project information, and all the scope. So in the Docker Swarm store, we would store the tenant information correspondingly. So you can filter out and show only those containers that were provisioned by a particular tenant. And Discovery is a service which, is, which helps you to uh, identify and discover nodes on which to provision. And Swarm has its own APIs and CLIs. So this is uh, the landscape that uh, we are suggesting, where a user authenticates and actually provisions using Docker Swarm. And Docker Swarm, in turn, connects to Keystone to get the token, and then validates the token, as we saw, and compares with the tenant list. And uh, once it is found to be valid, uh, provisions. So this is an environment you see where multiple tenants have provisioned containers, but that, that are existing on uh, you know same node, managed by a, a Swarm cluster. So this is a flow uh, diagram similar to what we saw how a PKA token is uh, obtained. So, uh, we'll see how it is adapted here. So the user, uh, as we discussed, sends the user ID and password and the tenant information uh, to Keystone to obtain the token. And uh, using that, you, you configure that in the config.json and then uh, submit your uh, command to Docker Swarm and which in turn calls Keystone again to validate, get the list of tenants and see whether it is validated. Plus uh, other uh, uh, metadata is available in the token anyway uh, with, with respect to your uh, expiry time and uh, created time and stuff. So validate against that and once it is found validated, then you execute, Docker Swarm executes the command and provisions on 
a particular chosen Docker host based on the scheduler's response. And then the response is sent back to the user. So this is a small change that we are suggesting make in the Docker Swarm code. But it is, this is more a conceptual. It's not hard and fast that you have to change it only in Docker Swarm. You can look at even other um, you know, way of orchestrating Docker containers. Uh, so similar logic can be implemented there as well. Since Keystone runs standalone and has its own database, we just need to do the association. For our prototype, we're currently using uh, the Docker Swarm. Correct. For our prototype, we are using Docker Swarm. But I think in previous uh, talk also, uh, someone talked about uh, Kubernetes having uh, a plugin for Docker. So that should be another option as well. So these are some of the things that we've been working on. Yes, the Keystone support the implementation is in progress. And whoever is interested, uh, we would share. Uh, if you want to contribute, uh, we'd, we'd be happy to work with you. And uh, these are some other things that we've planned for future. Uh, as I said, Fernet tokens is one of the exciting prospects. We want to implement that. So that means uh, the token, once you uh, unwrap the token, what all information that you fetch from it and how do you authenticate. So that implementation would vary for Fernet token compared to PKI. So that is something we want to explore and provide support for. And um, one more thing is isolated tenant networking capabilities, which is currently uh, your containers uh, have their own open networking, so they, they would be able to link with other containers that are in the same network. So we want to also, similar to how, uh, how there are tenant private networks in OpenStack, similar to that, we want to provide tenant networking capabilities for containers as well. Yeah, ma mainly work with the visibility part of the networks, uh, whether you want it private or not. So since you would have the, uh, the Docker instances itself, you know, certain instances which would be visible to you, uh, which are part of your uh, control, under your control. Similarly, we want to provide a set of public networks and private networks. So that is like a future use case that we would be working on on this. And um, so the last one is actually a, a framework which we want to also propose, which is any application that is running on a container. Uh, for example, uh, these days actually UX UI applications or any app uh, you can talk about Uber or uh, you know, Lyft, anything that is currently running Docker on production, if they have to use this Keystone authentication for their own services itself, not uh, for extending, you know, or uh, connecting between your front end or the back end. So for that, we want to provide a framework where an application can easily connect to Keystone and Make do the authorization easy. without much of a code change in the application itself. So this is also something that we want to work on. These are things that we've planned for future. Yeah, so connect with us, and uh, we'd be happy to work with uh, anyone who wants to join us in this effort. And uh, these are some of the references that I used. So that's about it. So any questions? Sorry. Sure. We'll be sharing this presentation as well. Yes. Okay. You have any questions or even feedback? Anything would be of great help. Yes. Hi. Yes. Are you going to speak about Coda? I thought. That was in the title. Did you cover that? Sorry, I couldn't hear the, you. The coda, coda part, the keystone coda for containers. Yeah, that uh, pretty much would come together with, uh, we, we would not be making changes over there as such, but that will be more of a logic change which you would come directly from uh, the keystone part itself. You know that after that you can't provision. So that will be a very simple logic where which would not let you provision over there. So the quota is anyway, the, uh, the administrator would be able to, you know, set that and uh, the information would, any, it would be as part of a Keystone API anyway. So once it gets stored in the database, it's just a matter of logic check, right? Yeah. So there's no special implementation needed for that per se, since no, Keystone already they, supports. They it's, it's a small adaptation from the Docker Swarm side. <laughs> so, <clears throat> have you guys changed the uh, uh, Keystone um, uh, our, our policy? to support uh, APIs for Swarm? Uh, yes, we are changing the policy.json. Uh, 
uh, for supporting uh, the Docker's a Docker uh, APIs. Docker APIs, yes. okay. and, uh, and also the service catalog. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. And the other thing is, uh, so uh, there is a uh, middleware, right, which um, runs on top of the service. So you guys are also using the Keystone middleware on top of uh, Swarm. No, we are not using the Keystone middleware for that. Okay, maybe I'll check. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned uh, some future work with a framework for container authentication, for container-to-container yeah. -container authentication. Um, but uh, have you thought much about uh, the enforcement mechanisms that you're going to utilize? Sorry? The Could enforcement you? to prevent container-to-container -container communication if they're not authenticated. Absolutely, yes. That should be also an option we should look at. Yes. Uh, it's not just about providing access. Yes. Uh, the restriction well, would come in there. Part of the part of the solution, right? Yeah. Authentication is one piece, but you got to enforce Correct. it, right? Correct. Yes. Correct. So yes. Keystone takes uh, care of your authentic uh, authentication and as well right. as authorization, who can access what, who can access, um, you know, what not components are meant to be accessed by you. So yeah, the, uh, when talking about networks, that would be definitely taken care of. The idea is to have a framework where you can actually define what would be allowed and what would not be allowed. For example, in a simple implementation, if you have to think, you could just have the uh, you know, list of roles defined. Uh, forget about OpenStack. If you're just accessing any application, you, you could have multiple levels of users that want to access. You could have just an enum defining their role and what is the mapping role that, or mapping resources that they can access. So this, this, can, this should be something not in the core. This should be configurable easily. And th the idea is to have a framework where a configurable data can be implemented. No, so uh, getting your question correct, you were talking about the networks uh, part that we said or uh, the... I was more concerned with the underlying enforcement. Okay. Right? It's a, uh, policy is one thing, right? But yeah. somehow you have to enforce that policy by some means, right? Yeah. Um, like uh, IP tables, for example. Yes. Right. Right. So those changes would be like when we talk about networks, th those will be uh, OVS specific changes where you you know you are restricting the traffic from uh, okay. one to other. Yeah. Sure. Okay. They okay. would come under the isolated network uh, plans, actually. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Excuse me. That I have a question about the network part. That seems like you are. Are uh, going to use Docker native uh, network? Do you have any plan to integrate with Quora? Uh, I I mean that seems like Quora want to very similar things. Uh, want want to do very similar things about uh, what you are doing. So yeah, we still have to take a look and design that part. So we can definitely take a look at the network piece itself. Um, for now, what we were looking at was uh, integration with the Neutron part itself. So, but um, I mean, we can definitely yeah. connect offline and see what uh, uh, what it brings. Is that to part the we haven't even designed yet? Yeah, I mean, uh, Quora already integrated with Docker network with Neutron network. Okay, we have okay. already done yes. this. Okay, so, so then, then yeah, we'll, definitely we'll we can connect back uh, after this uh, talk. Yes, yeah. we can discuss more on that because that is something yeah. planned for future. But yes, definitely we would want to discuss on that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so I think anything else? Okay, yeah. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you.